Okay, hi. Good morning, everyone. My name is Bridget Conley. I'm the research director at the World Peace Foundation at the Fletcher School, which is at Tufts University. We are honored to have all of you join us today from locations scattered across the globe. Right now, I'm sitting in Somerville, not far from Tufts Medford campus. And behind me is a, a photo of the ground today um, that I took earlier. The land that my home and Tufts University are situated on is Wampanoag and Massachusetts traditional territory. This land was also the site of Walnut Hill, part of a slave holding estate called the Ten Hills Plantation. Articulating a land acknowledgement is an important practice, and I'd like to thank one of today's panelists, Ingrid Newman, for reminding me to do it. It's also particularly relevant to the questions that we've been exploring in this seminar series in their presence. We've been asking, how should the remains of people who were subject to state-sponsored violence be dignified, particularly within museum structures? So against the increasingly fragile permanence right, of the ground we stand on or the illusory permanence of the institutions we build is a profound challenge of learning to pay attention to the sediments of the past and to listen to the ways of being on this ground that preceded us and that might just yet guide us forward. So despite the fact that we're all joining via Zoom, or actually maybe even more so because of that fact, the very distinct sediments of our locations are exceptionally important. So I also wanted to welcome you here today uh, with a confession of my deep enjoyment of museums. I worked at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum for 10 years um, and was profoundly impacted by my colleagues there. But I, I say that as a confession because I know that the sentiment um, is a statement that reveals my age, my class, my race, but also because I know that I am a very bad visitor of museums. Um, so here's the confession. I rarely read labels in depth. I get transfixed by ridiculous details that no curator ever intended for us to focus on. And I often find other visitors just as interesting as the displays. But I enjoy all sorts of museums, from the most well-endowed art museum to a dusty corner collection, to stunningly painful memorial museums, uh, to past atrocities. What I appreciate most is they provide space that's set aside to think about how the world is ordered. And one never need accept the order that is presented. In fact, for me, challenging that order is part of the work of visiting. So what I like is the invitation to visit. In that spirit, we want to extend a warm welcome to all of you to challenge and engage with our speakers at this, the third event in this series, Examining Human Remains in Museums. And with that, I'd like to turn over the microphone to my colleague, Diane O'Donohue, who will be moderating today's event. Thank you so much, Bridget, for those um, beautiful, moving, evocative words, and also to Ingrid, to my thanks for the land acknowledgement reminder, so important always, and particularly in a situation such as this. I'm Diane O'Donohue. I am the director of the Program for Public Humanities at the Jonathan M. Tisch College for Civic Life, and it is my pleasure to introduce our three panelists I will introduce them in the order of their presentations. We've asked our panelists to prepare approximately 20 minutes of comments. And then based on the precedent of last panel where we found the conversation between the panelists so fascinating and rich, we have asked our three panelists if for about 20 minutes, they will speak amongst themselves offering comments and questions, responses to their presentations. We have the opportunity, as it were, to listen in on that. Um, while that is going on, though, feel free to pose questions in the Q&A 
and I will um, moderate that. We will then finish in about 20 minutes that group conversation amongst our panelists, and the remainder of the time will be devoted to your questions and comments, and we will be concluding at around uh, at noon time, uh, Eastern time. Our first speaker is Ingrid Newman, Museum Conservator of Sculpture at the Museum of the Rhode Island School of Design. She's also an instructor in the graduate program in museum studies here at Tufts. She began her career after completing her graduate work as an objects conservator at the Smithsonian. And before going to RISD, she was the head of sculpture conservation at the Williamstown Art Conservation Center where she also taught in the graduate program there in art history at Williams. She then went on to become a sculpture conservator at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. In recent years, she's been involved with the care of Ms. Mean, an Egyptian priest whose remains and coffin entered the RISD collection in 1938. And this work among much of the rest of her work will inform her remarks today on the conservation of human remains as museum objects. Susanna Joban is senior postdoctoral researcher at the Austrian Academy of Science and the, its Institute of Cultural Studies and Theater History, where she is working on a project entitled Globalized Memorial Museums, Exhibiting Atrocities in the Era of Claims for Moral Universals. Dr. Joban did her graduate studies in philosophy and cultural studies at Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznan, Poland. She's had a number of postdoctoral fellowships, including the University of Constance, Humboldt University, the University of Amsterdam, as well as the International Institute for Holocaust Research, Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, and at the Vienna Wiesenthal Institute for Holocaust Studies. Her publications include the edited volume, Mapping the Forensic Turn, Engagements with Materialities of Mass Death in Holocaust Studies and Beyond. Her contribution to that volume is an essay entitled Between Subjectivities and Objectification, Theorizing Ashes. And she will be speaking on Governing Ashes, the Ethics, Politics, and material survivance of incinerated human remains. Stephen Lubar is the professor of American studies, history and art history at Brown University, where he is faculty director of the Center for Digital Scholarship. He had previously directed the Center for Public Humanities and the Hafenreffer Museum of Anthropology, both at Brown. Professor Lubar has authored a number of books and articles, particularly with an emphasis on museums and the histories of technology. Most recently, he is the author of The Lost Museum, Curating Past and Present, a work supported while he was a Guggenheim Fellow. And he will be speaking today on multiple matters that determine the life of museum objects. And we will first turn now to Ingrid Newman. Hello. Good morning. Let's see. Share my screen. Okay. Good morning and thank you for making time in your day to attend this series of seminars of which I feel very grateful to be a small part. I would like to thank both Bridget and Diane for organizing them. I have personally learned so much from the previous speakers in 2020 and so look forward to the next two seminars later in 2021. Today I'm speaking to you from Pawtuxet Village in Cranston, Rhode Island which means Little Falls in the Narragansett language. The Narragansett and the Wampanoag First Nations people continue to live on and teach us about the importance of their ancestral and present homelands and waterways. Today, I would like to pay respect to the past, present and their emerging elders and to thank them for their stewardship of our collective, unique and irreplaceable natural resources. 
I would also like to recognize the significant role that Rhode Islanders have played in the transatlantic slave trade. In addition to the fact that many Rhode Islanders owned actual people, they also owned more enslaved people per capita than any other New England state. Without a doubt, this fact serves as a sobering and very tragic part of our state's history. Finally, I would like to acknowledge the difficult times that we are all currently living in. I would like to honor the massive number of deceased individuals throughout the world who have lost their lives in this ongoing pandemic. And I would like to especially honor the first responders who have been and continue to be so selfless in their daily work of taking care of all of the rest of us. Thank you. Ownership and display of human remains is a human rights issue. In the following 20 minutes, I will attempt to present an overview of the wide variety of context in which human remains have traditionally been or are currently displayed in museums. I will conclude by posing questions for consideration, especially with regard to the display of human remains at Memorial Museums, as Bridget alluded to. To begin with, I would like to remind the audience of a few of the legislative documents which have relevance to the display of human remains. Of particular importance is the existence of the International Council of Museums, or ICOM. ICOM is a museum organization which is tied to both UNESCO and the United Nations Economic and Social Council. Revised in 2006 and available in 39 languages, ICOM's Code of Ethics for Natural History Museums specifically addresses human remains and their care. Often historically categorized as archeological and or anthropological specimens, quote unquote, human remains have traditionally been relegated to natural history museums in many countries. Albeit general in its recommendations, this document does delineate that the care of human remains requires specific standards that a museum professional should acknowledge and follow with regard to ethical best standards of practice. These general recommendations are of course subject to interpretation. 20th century legislation additionally includes the Vermilion Accord of Human Remains and the Native American Grave Protection and Repatriation Act, AKA NACPRA, and more recently in the 21st century with the Human Tissue Act, the Revised Code of Ethics, and the Tamaki Macau Ral Accord of Display of Human Remains and Sacred Objects. The actual display of human remains takes many forms in museums. I would like to apologize in advance if any of these images are offensive to you and if they cause you any emotional discomfort today. In principle, I should probably not be showing you any of these images out of respect for the dignity of the deceased human beings. However, for the purpose of this forum, it is important, I feel, to share these images. Please refrain from taking screenshots. An important aspect of ICOM's code of ethics is to highlight the reference to the illicit trade of human remains referring to monetary transactions of human remains, which continue to occur, for example, at auction houses. This is an important current situation that requires continual guidance and education of all stakeholders. I would like to reference that renowned contemporary artists such as English artist Damien Hirst work with elements of human remains. Although this 18th century skull has been recast in platinum, Hearst chose to keep the original human teeth in situ. Because of these teeth, I would categorize the sculpture as human remains. Incidentally, Hearst is considered to be, to be one of the UK's wealthiest living artists. This is another example of profiting from human remains. I would like to contrast Hearst with the contemporary American artist, Virgil Marty, who casts replicas of human bones for his artwork. In this work, Marty has elected to cast human bones in reinforced plaster. Does the fact that he replicates the bones actually take away from the overall impact of the work? Now I wish to look back to the past and see how we got to this place reminding us of how human bones have been exhibited in churches, 
for centuries prior to the establishment of so-called museums. At this cathedral, it is said that the remains of St. James the Great exist in the small box located in an underground crypt. Since the bones themselves cannot be visually seen by visitors, is this considered to be an intangible display as it relies on personal faith? In Italy, the purpose of this chapel was to house and display the overall, the overflow of human bones from deceased local monks, prisoners, and hospital patients. Although not technically a museum, this is certainly a significant early tangible display of human remains. A similar chapel exists in Portugal. The intended purpose of this public church display was specifically for visitor meditation and reflection. Highlighted in an article last year in The Guardian, I became aware of other functions that human remains have historically served, such as these aprons from Tibet, although sometimes mixed with animal bones, used originally in Tantric Buddhism to celebrate life. In this case, consultations with Tibetans were undertaken in preparation for display at the British Museum, and these video conversations were included in the exhibition to give these human remains the necessary context with which to truly understand their original purpose. Other human remains often displayed without context include those which were preserved in peat and have been unfortunately commonly referred to as bog bodies, an outdated and disrespectful term used to explain their archeological origin. Although their descriptor states the location in which they were originally discovered, a bog, their display within the museum has not been adequately contextualized. As you can see from this slide, there are a few such humans located in a variety of national museums in the UK and Scandinavia, as well as in more than one medical museum that I am aware of in the US. Archaeological university museums also display human remains without context and also without consent from the deceased individuals. These two humans who met with an untimely death in 79 AD after the deadly eruption of Mount Vesuvius in Italy evoke substantial suffering even though they have been recreated only in plaster and do not contain human remains. I am curious if you feel that these figures convincingly convey their historic story without the actual display of authentic human bones. In this case, these figures do have adequate context as they are in the exact location in which they perished. The Natural History Museum at the Smithsonian Institution was originally the National Repository for Indigenous Human Remains for 80 years until NAGPRA was established in 1990. This law enacted by Congress required museum item by item inventories to be conducted of Native American and Native Hawaiian human remains and associated funerary objects. This work is ongoing and is by no means finished despite the 31 years that have transpired since the enactment of this important law. Repatriation is directly related to the display of human remains because it recognizes that the retention of human remains in museums for scientific purposes is no longer an adequate reason to hoard deceased human individuals. These individuals had also never given their consent. I was a postgraduate conservation intern in my 20s at this Natural History Museum, considered affectionately as our nation's attic, and was privy to the minimal and inadequate storage of many skeletal remains which were kept in unlocked drawers lining long hallways outside of the anthropology conservation lab in the late 1980s prior to the advent of NAGPRA. One day I opened a random drawer in the hallway only to discover that there were human bones rattling around in a rather disconcerting fashion. As you probably already know, repatriation is occurring all over the world in various forms Museum collections acquired or arguably stolen from colonies 
conducted by means of military or exploratory invasions from overarching ambitious nations has yielded a significant amount of accession collections for a majority of the largest museums throughout the globe. Repatriation of these collections is a long and complicated political and legal process, but it is happening. In this slide, you'll see that human heads of Maori people formerly known, formerly owned by the Ethnological Museum in Berlin are being repatriated to New Zealand. These human individuals also had never given their consent to be displayed. Pictured here in the Welt Museum in Vienna are so-called trophy heads. Some may remember an article in the art newspaper in 2018, which discussed the severed head from a Munduruku individual, one of the indigenous people of Brazil living in the Amazon. To date, I do not believe that the skull has been repatriated, but rather the museum chose in this case to expand the contextual information on the text panel as currently recommended by the ICOM Code of Ethics. While archeological humans cannot provide consent for obvious reasons, living peoples can. In this slide, I'm juxtaposing on the left, a human that has not given consent for their display in a museum with a deceased human displayed in the Body Works exhibition on the right, in which the individuals allegedly did provide consent for their display. This is an important distinction. In addition to the concept of consent, I would also like to address the concept of respect. The Mütter Museum was the personal collection of Dr. Thomas Dent Mütter. The skeletal remains held within medical museums have long been considered to be acceptable based on the premise that they are needed for scientific study and disease research. However, these historic display techniques may evoke more of a spectacle atmosphere infused with shock value. What do you think? In this recent exhibition at the National Library of Medicine, the crania are encased in an inert environment of glass with subdued lighting evoking a more somber environment. The dark colored walls may signify a more sensitive or intentional approach to their display. Does this make the exhibit more respectful? Medical collections and museums can also originate from historical collections gathered by hospitals. The Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation inherited over a thousand human skulls from colonies once controlled by Germany. Currently, I understand that the PCHF is trying to determine how to return these skulls to their rightful owners in Rwanda, Tanzania, Burundi, and Mozambique. 2007 Body Works exhibit was an unprecedented form of exhibition displaying real human bodies it is reported that these bodies were eventually donated with the consent of the deceased individuals. The bodies have been preserved with a form of polymerization. As a consequence of this exhibit, it is important to note that a series of legal bills were introduced to the New York State Legislature, focusing specifically on associated health concerns rather than any ethical ones. Respect as a concept in museum displays is not a new idea. Over 50 years ago, for instance, the Hall of the Royal Mummies at the Egyptian Museum in Cairo was temporarily closed until, quote, a dignified and safe presentation of the mummies was said to be obtained, unquote. In Egypt, the display of mummified humans is not generally questioned, however, because of their universally understood historical context and the pride with which Egyptians view their ancient culture. Fast forward to 2008 at the Manchester Museum where Egyptian mummified human remains were partially covered and eventually completely covered by cloth in an attempt to bring more respect to the mummified individual. What is the effectiveness of this partially or completely concealed mummified individual still on display? What is the message it sends? Is it a confusing message? At the RISD Museum, we have one Egyptian mummified person in our collection. These mummified remains were acquired in 1938. When I first arrived at the museum in 2007, Esmin, a priest from the second to first century BCE, 
was displayed alongside of his sarcophagus in a climate controlled oak exhibition case under an acrylic bonnet. Note, it means original cartonnage face mask is no longer physically associated with him as it has been in the collection of the British Museum since 1885. 2014, the sixth floor exhibitions were renovated. At that time, we purchased a new inert metal climate control case with compartments for silica gel, specifically designed to create a stable environment for this complex, complex collection. We displayed as mean in a layered fashion, similar to that at the Ashmolean Museum at Oxford University. More recently in 2018, a deliberate decision was made to remove as means mummified remains from public view. This was the result of vocal public opinion. Here you can see the two iterations of his display. It's interesting to note that Esmin's name is visibly displayed in hieroglyphics on the top of his sarcophagus. In this way, the public can still recite Esmin's name in a respectful form of remembrance. By placing Esmin back into his sarcophagus, we are respecting him in an outward facing and public way. On a digital level, we also have removed the image of his mummified remains from our museum website. How are memorial museums different from other museums? Are displays of human remains in memorial museums in a unique category? At the Red Terror Martyrs Memorial Museum in Ethiopia, skeletal remains are enclosed in glass boxes. Is the unconventional organization of these bones evocative of the way in which this particular individual was killed? Is the stack of glass display boxes symbolic of mass graves in which individuals are piled on top of one another? Is the impact of seeing these skeletal remains exponentially more powerful by associating them with a human face on a photograph? Is it essential to exhibit actual human remains? Would it be acceptable to cast replica bones and then rebury the original human remains? or would that adversely impact and decrease the intensity of a memorial? ICOM Africa does not appear to have any specifically tailored ethical guidelines that address memorial museums, such as those in Ethiopia and Rwanda. Perhaps this is an area about which to concentrate in the future. wrap up, I would like to offer some tangible considerations for the display of human remains. Firstly, a physical barrier such as a curtain could be constructed in order to allow the visitor to choose whether or not they are emotionally able to take in human remains during a museum visit. Secondly, the use of specific signage that would prepare museum visitors prior to confronting a display may aid in recognizing that not, not all museum visitors may react in the exact same way, and additionally would pay respect to the right of the visitor to choose when they are able, prepared to do so. Thirdly, photographic restrictions could be considered for both the in-person experience as well as the online website presence after consultation with the descendants of the communities displayed. Fourthly, a private space in the museum could be made available for visitors to process what they have seen and to write about their visitor experience in public and private formats. Fifthly, visitor surveys could be carried out to better understand what visitors are thinking and feeling when experiencing these ex ex exhibitions. Perceptions and trends may change and regular surveying could help to identify how the general public and the local population currently perceive these displays as their opinions potentially change over time. Lastly, I would like to mention that ICOM will be revisiting their code of ethics this year and hopefully this will be an opportunity for ICOM members along with other entities from all continents to voice their opinion about the display of human remains.
Here are some of the important references which I consulted for this presentation and from which I gained an enormous amount of insight into this complex issue of exhibiting human remains throughout the world. Thank you for your attention and I look forward to further discussion following the next two speakers. Uh, thank you very much, Ingrid. This was amazing. And uh, thank you also for organizing and organizing this, uh, this wonderful panel. I'm incredibly happy to, uh, to be here. Uh, I will also focus on uh, human remains uh, in museums, but zoom in a little bit and, and uh, concentrate on uh, their specific uh, modality, uh, that is ashes. I will also show some images that can be considered disturbing uh, but I feel that it's uh, in the framework of the presentation, uh, it's uh, justifiable, but would ask you to uh, refrain from uh, taking pictures. Um, thank you. Um, I will begin by referencing a 2016 article by Howard Williams, uh, who is a mortuary archaeologist, who in his research focuses on the British Isles and uh, Scandinavia in the early Middle Ages, a reality quite far off from where I situate my academic interests, at a first glance, at least. Williams, not yet, not yet. <laughs> Williams analyzes the early medieval practices and architectures of cremation and his 2016 text titled Firing the Imagination, Cremation in Museums poses a direct question about the uneasy position of cremated remains in the European uh, museal landscape. In the archeological and historical museums, William examines display of human remains is not yet uh, very contested. What he observes, nevertheless, is that also where there is a debate as to how and why to present human remains in museums, cremated or burnt remains are virtually absent from it. While oftentimes in the museums he looked at, cremated remains are in display, although rarely afforded center stage, they have been, writes Williams, systematically overlooked in discussions of human remains in museums and hardly ever subject to critical discussion. Williams sees this as a result of a well-established though problematic valorization of corporal wholeness and uh, corporal visit integrity by both museum visitors and the museum themselves. The fixation with visuality and materiality resurrecting a corporal integrity of the dead, a quote from Williams, establishes cremated or burnt remains as less effective anchors of imagination and knowledge production. Whole bodies yield imagination, make past individuals capable, establish indexical links to past lives. They are the embodiment of the, as he calls it, uncanny objectuality of that body, affording strong affective responses as one's living human beings. Corporeal integrity to establishes the cadaver as evidential, as able to store and yield scientific data, rendering cremation, cremains or cremated remains second rate. In contemporary society goes the argument, here the next slide, please. Cremated or disarticulated remains are considered less evidential and less abject. They are regarded as more intraceable as objects of scientific scrutiny, less knowledgeable, less human, and less individual as persons. And this, argues uh, Williams, has ramifications for how museums display the dead. As it is often the case, I partially agree and partially disagree with Williams. He is definitely right to claim that fragmentary, burned, or cremated remains have still received little academic attention and have yet to become a subject of critical uh, discussion, but this changes uh, steadily. I also second Williams on the point that incinerated remains need to be seen not as a second-rate corporality of the dead, but as a different one, 
equally important to engage with analytically, but also ethically and politically. This is especially the case when the fire transformed remains do not result from cremation, but instead are an outcome of a violent and purposeful, purposeful destruction of the dead. But not only, as we are re reminded by the debates surrounding the repatriation of cremated bundles to Australia from the European Museum collections. What is needed, I argue after Williams, is an attention to the uneasy materiality of burnt remains, indeed distinct from articulated, unburned, but or fleshed human remains. Their ethics, politics, and affordances beyond or below the wholeness and integrity paradigm. Ashes challenge, but also expand the notion of what constitutes human remains. They need to become part of the discussion how, why, and whether to present human remains in museums. As I work in a context quite distinct from Williams, that is looking at the ashes resulting from the Holocaust, the last questions whether to exhibit human remains is where we decisively part ways. For my point of view, human remains do not belong in a museum. But in fact, surprisingly often they do. The issue was and remains contested and it needs to be attended to. Ashes from the Holocaust are still displayed there or in urns, curated, stored. Sometime they are, sometimes they are accidentally discovered in the museum archives, as was recently the case in the Holocaust Muse Museum in Safran. Uh, next slide, please. In the summer of uh, 2019, during the renovation works, the museum staff discovered several objects, among them a box with incinerated human remains, which sat there since the 80s. Uh, the image does not uh, present the box. It's another uh, item uh, from, from this collection. It was a donation from a Holocaust survivor who most probably collected the ashes at the extermination camp in Helmno, located in contemporary Poland. The box presented a challenge to the museum employees. It was examined at a funerary home to establish whether it in fact contained human remains. After the museum engaged in a series of consultation with rabbinical authorities, lawyers, and after securing permissions from the Polish Consul General and the Memorial Museum in Helmno, the ashes were buried at the local Jewish cemetery. There, this case is by no means unique, but what I want to stress, uniquely not surrounded by a scandal. In my presentation, I would like to focus on the contestations around burned human remains, their meanings and dynamics, and ramifications for the presence and or absence of burned human remains in Holocaust-related museums and memorial sites. Following Williams, I will think through their object and evidential value, arguing nevertheless that in the case of remains originating in political violence, objectuality and in the evidentiality convey a somewhat different set of meanings. That they all are too far from exhausting the reality of human remains in and outside of the museum. And also, instead of centering on the question how cremated remains figure in museums, that animated Williams's text, I move one step further. The frame of this panel, the life of museum objects, is for me a clear invitation to look beyond the objects on display and search instead for processes and practices behind it being there, the context of acquisition, collecting, selecting, displaying, archive, archiving or hiding, preserving, and finally burying to foreground the mo movements of human remains in and out of museums, to look moreover at the pre, post or beyond museum life of object. I consider this as an invitation to tie the question of challenging materiality of us with another more fundamental one. How in the, is in the first place ashes are constituted and undone as museum objects and more importantly, how they are constituted and undone as human remains. Looking beyond the object fixed in the museum, its meaning hegemonically closed, I will attend rather to transformations uh, incinerated human remains undergo. The first transformation, as the Nazis were well aware, is instantiated by the burning itself, which constitutes 
an intervention into material register of human remains, rendering the formerly living being indistinguishable and almost intangible as subject. It is a radical and often violent intervention into bodies, wholeness and, uh, and evidentiality, but never entirely. I will start this exploration by referring to two recent instances in which incinerated human remains were afforded center stage exactly as incinerated human remains and their presence variously mediated, incited a debate. I chose them because they are both, they both affected me considerably as a person and due to their physical and conceptual closeness uh, to my work. Uh, next slide. The first is about the accidental discovery of human remains on the Dalem campus of the Freie University in Berlin, just two years prior to my temporary employment at the institution, neighboring with the location where the remains were found. In the summer of 2014, human skeletal remains were found by workers replacing a pipe under a sidewalk. According to the official script, the workers informed the police. Um, later on, the remains were sent to the Forensic Medicine Institute uh, at Charité and investigated, then handed to Federal Institute of um, Forensic and Social Me Medicine, and finally cremated and anonymously buried. This happened while the university authorities and scholars from the neighboring Max Planck Society must have realized, as they admittedly did, that the remains could have belonged to the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute of Anthropology, Human Heredity and Eugenics. The institute housed, amongst others, a collection of human remains from the extermination camp Auschwitz-Birkenau. The actual debate around human remains started only after they have already been cremated. It revolved primarily around the questions, how could they have been handled had the cremation not taken place? The strongest voices in this debate belong to the historian of national socialism, Götz Ali, and the archaeologist from the Freie University uh, Berlin, Reinhard Bernbeck. And it reverberated strongly with the positions taken by those participating on the questionable side sometimes in the repatriation and deaccession debates uh, of human remains from the colonial collections. Why the historian argues that the remains should have been investigated in order to establish whether they indeed um, originated from the collection sent to, uh, to the Institute uh, by Josef Mengele from Auschwitz-Birkenau. Uh, the archaeologist, uh, surprisingly, uh, claimed the investigation of human re remains would, in this context, translate into their another or subsequent objectification, one resembling the operations performed on them by the Nazis. But the debate was considered by both as purely theoretical. The cremation of the remains foreclosed any actual decisions. Indeed, as suggested by Williams, ashes established and unknown uh, were established as non-evidentiary and reduced to an, to an extent in their to their non-evidentiary value. As a result, little interest uh, was placed on the actual human remains, the cremated remains, their material trajectory as ashes and subse subsequent uh, fate. But the debate around Dalem uh, skeletons resulted in a further archaeological research that is uh, still taking place and a conference in Yad Vashem in 2017, which in turn produced recommendation guidelines for the handling of future uh, discoveries of remains of human victims of Nazi terror, as if the debate was not plaking, taking place since the 80s. The second intervention I decided to focus uh, on couldn't be more different in its take on the materiality of ash. Uh, the next slide, please. I'm talking about the action uh, Sucht nach uns, Search for Us, uh, by a, a German artistic collective Center for Political Beauty. In December in, of 2019, uh, the collective uh, established an artistic in, uh, installation uh, 
in the in front of the Bundestag. It was a pillar containing ashes um, collected in the vicinity of the former extermination camp uh, of Birkenau. So at least claim uh, the claim the collective. The action was framed to, through several uh, through an assemblage of uh, of postulates and uh, and texts and uh, interventions. Uh, it was a call to, for Germany to finally engage with the material legacy of their crimes, still deposited in unmarked graves or burial pits throughout Eastern Europe. The ashes exhibited in the center of Berlin were to function as a material uh, evidence of both the crimes committed during the war and the Holocaust, and the fact that they still are to a large extent neglected. The installation was also framed by the writings of members of the Sonderkommando and hence the title of the work, Search for Us. Um, but it was also framed through, through archival research uh, called framed as Paths of Ashes um, that was an empirically based investigation of the methods of the disposal of ashes and production and disposal of ashes and the Nazi concentration camps. Uh, comes. Finally, the work was framed by a forensic report uh, attesting that the material indeed contained burned human remains. As you can imagine, the uh, installation didn't survive long. Uh, it was put there on Monday and taken down on, on Wednesday um, on the initiative of the collective this, themselves, but in a response to immense criticism that the work to a great extent, legitimately, legitimately met. Uh, it was criticized as an uh, exercise in desecration uh, of the dead, their instrumentalization and appropriation of human remains that most probably belonged to the Jewish victims of the camp by German artistic collective. In the official statement after the dismantling of the pillar, the collective which should be acknowledged, apologized and uh, removed the human remains, uh, posing nevertheless the question where and to whom those incinerated human remains belong. The ashes were eventually handed over to the Orthodox Rabbinical Conference, to the German uh, uh, rabbinical authorities, uh, and buried. But the unsettling uncertainty around the actual uh, content of the pillar remains. Were the remains, if they were indeed human or cons consisted of uh, human material, Jewish or non-Jewish? Were they human on, or non-human? Those questions render the remains and the pillar and the very inst in installation deeply religiously, ethically and politically charged. And this, I would like to dwell for a second on uh, on this uh, unsettling uncertainty uh, when it in comes to also to human remains and burned incinerated human remains exhibited uh, in museums. Because uh, I would argue it is exactly this unsettling uncertainty around the ostensibly non evidentiality of burned remains and their deeply affected impact that translated into their presence of the presence of ashes from the Holocaust in museum collections. One can only imagine how the encounter with the site of the former extermination camp at Helmno, littered with charted pieces of cremated bone, must have impacted the Holocaust survivors, Holocaust survivor who collected them, packed in a box, took with him to the US to finally donate the box to the Southern Holocaust Museum. The practice is by no means specific to this one situation and has received a considerable interest from Holocaust researchers. The bottom, I'm talking about the bottom up practice of collecting and transfer of human remains throughout the diasporic Jewish world in the 40s and the 50s. Next slide. When it developed, there were hardly available forensic means to establish the actual content of the material collected by survivors at the former extermination camps. The line separating ash from soil from the camps and there it was and remains thin. It is for this reason that I frame this practice as materialization, 
It is in doing so I intend to give justice to premises on which people collecting ashes and burned remains in fact acted on and through those whose practices the ashes materialized as, uh, as such. This was brought about by the attempt to contain the corporeal remains pulverized into dust by putting them into boxes, bags, and urns. Thus, the reconstructing or re reconstituting or materialization uh, of the inorganic matter, chunks of unidentif uh, unidentifiable bone, soil, and debris into human remains, unfolded first through the performative gesture of collecting it from the site of former camps and mass burial sites and expressive, although often purely instinctive, uh, act of protection of, and care. Often, af only afterwards were the remains donated to the memorial institutions in Israel, such as Mount Zion or Yad Vashem, where they were ceremoniously buried, or handled, handed to the museums wor wor worldwide, where they entered the exhibition, as was the case with the Dallas Holocaust Museums, museum analyzed by Team Co in selling the Holocaust, or ended up in storage rooms or the archives. But there was also an alternative, more institutionalized trajectory through, through which burned human remains could end up in museums worldwide. Borrowing from my colleague, next slide please, Ran Zwickenberg, I would frame it in terms of deaf diplomacy a practice of exchanging or donating gifts by museums established at the former extermination camps to survivor, as, as survivor associations and museums all over the world. As indicated by the example of the Japanese Auschwitz Peace Museums, this practice cut deep into the 80s. Also in this case, the museum authorities claimed ownership and authority over human remains, regardless of them being potentially Jewish and without any attempt to secure consent. The permission of the Jewish survivors of the camps was, as we can imagine, not necessary or seen as necessary. The remains could be argued were claimed politically and instrumentalized by uh, very often Polish museums. But interestingly, it is also in the late 80s that the presence of human remains in this place uh, in the off-site Holocaust museums becomes contested, as evidenced by the decision of the US, uh, US uh, HMM, or the US uh, Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, not to include human remains as its permanent exhibition. And yet, also there they are contained in the memorial space of the museums, in the Hall of Remembrance, it is there that the museums houses the soil from various Nazi extermination camp and US military cemeteries. The presence of the soil, perhaps containing ash, transforms not only the content of the buried material, but also the memorial space, space that houses it. The difference between the earlier practices around burned human remains and those that had materialized them in the present day memorial landscapes in the museum in Suffern or in contemporary Berlin rests in the attentiveness to their material presence as human remains, literalizing them as incinerated bodies. Next slide, please. This move beyond performative materialization of materializations of incinerated human remains or the somewhat problematic metaphor of the soil is unquestionably driven by the broader debates of human remains in museums, but also by the advent of forensic sensibilities and the development of forensic sciences, their methods and technologies enabling now also investigation of incinerated human remains. This too implies a decisive move beyond the notion of its non evidentiality uh, I'm pointing your attention now to the picture on, uh, on the right, uh, which um, actually depicts the, uh, the beginning of the, uh, one of the first forensic investigations that focus on, a, uh, on a graves containing ashes or the disposal, body disposal pits containing ashes, which uh, was launched uh, more or less at the same time when the action of uh, the Center for Political Beauty in Berlin by the Polish Institute of uh, National Remembrance in the Białute Forest, uh, which was in the execution site of uh, both Jewish and uh, non-Jewish Polish citizens during the war and then uh, subjected to 
um, to the action of uh, 1005, that is cremation of remains. The remains were uncovered, uh, they were uh, collected, and uh, two tons of, of the contents of the uh, of the body disposal pits uh, are now uh, awaiting forensic investigation uh, in the laboratory of the Medical University uh, of, um, of Szczecin. But as indicated uh, by the controversy surrounding the Dalem case and the intervention by the Center for Political Beauty, this opens space for a new set of questions pertaining to further handling of incinerated human remains, not only their evidentiality uh, and objectuality, but also their place. Uh, next slide, please. And here I um, borrow um, the framing from Thomas Laquer, who used it in a totally different sense and, and totally different uh, manner in the work uh, of the dead to open space for, uh, for a set of, que of questions uh, about uh, the future of, uh, of ashes uh, when materialized and subjected to forensic uh, research. Are they to be, uh, are the remains uh, at the former extermination camps to be now exhumed and examined, and if yes, at whose by request and by whom, and who should be given consent? Are the burnt remains from the Holocaust still collected and displayed in the museums worldwide to be investigated, deaccessioned, and repatriated? And if so, to whom or where? What I think is uh, also uh, necessary is the, this, in this context is the need to rethink the ashes and their materiality, thinking towards new materializations of incinerated human remains and new ethics and ethical guidelines developing around them. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Ingrid and Susanna have shown us some of the complexities of dealing with human remains in museums. I want to explore objects in museums that partake of some of the same, partake of some of that same complexity, objects that are in some sense alive, full of meaning, spiritual. <laughs> I want to think about these objects and about how we might learn from the reverence that museums have begun to pay to human remains to think about what other to think about what other objects might also be treated with more reverence or be made available to the public in a way that will allow them to treat them with more reverence. What might we gain from thinking about our objects as more than just objects? There are four basic ideas keep in mind when they think about objects. Uh, there's intellectual control, that is, you know what you have, physical control, that objects are findable, that they are conserved, uh, that they're in good environment, administrative control, that the rules are followed, that you have good rules for how you, how you uh, treat things. And finally, a very complicated category, moral control, which is um, that they're treated like they will be forever, that they're precious, but without monetary value, uh, that they're available to the public, um, and that as appropriate, they're available to the public, and that their story is told in, in an appropriate way. This is a minimum, of course, and museum people debate the details. How good is a good enough environment? What standard of care allows for objects to be kept forever? How do you balance that with the need for objects to put their collections to use? 
for many years, the museums have followed what they call the Rembrandt rule, the rule that every object in a museum needed to be treated like it's a Rembrandt, even if it's not a Rembrandt, even if it's just a tube of toothpaste. Um, recently, some museums have pushed back, arguing that not everything needs to be treated this way. Arguments are partly along the grounds of practicality, setting an impossibly high standard is expensive. But more than that, treating every object as precious as untouchable can also interfere with using objects for interpretation, using objects to tell stories. There's another way to read the Rembrandt rule too, though. Think about museum objects this way. We are setting up a certain relationship between object and viewer. Objects are displayed in a museum-like way. They're framed, they're behind glass. Uh, they're in a context with similar things. It's a very much a museumified space, this kind of way of thinking about objects requires. We access museum objects like this visually at a remove. They're precious, but outside the real world. They resist human connections. They're just objects. They're not fully the bundles of stories and connections that they could be. How white might we reimagine museum object as being more than material, more than object? How might certain objects be treated differently? What if we considered carefully the range of objects in museum object and thought about meaning and use and human connections? What if we followed through on material culture theorist Daniel Miller's suggestion that we move beyond the dualism of artifacts and persons? What if we took seriously for all of our objects, the indigenous museum practice of thinking of things, as museum theorist Ruth Phillips puts it, as beings or grandfathers rather than specimens, objects, artifacts, or works of art? One way we might do this is to think of all of our objects as being, in some ways, sacred. We might think of museum objects as existing on a continuum. At one extreme are art objects intended for display in museums. At the other, objects that should not be in museums at all, indigenous human remains, for example. And there's a vast range of in-betweens. There's objects whose meanings come from story or use or personal connections. There are objects that are sacred and private or sacred and public. There are objects that are in some religious, that, that partake in some religious traditions, uh, partake of the human, that are alive and need to be treated as such. What I want to do is complicate that enlightenment ideal of the dead object. In this talk, I won't be addressing human remains, but objects that partake in some ways of the human, of the sacred, of the spirit, objects that are more than just things. I want to look at objects that are numinous, even haunted. There are, of course, many ways for objects can be, that objects can be numinous or sacred or in some way human. Hey, Stephen, would you mind, there's a little interference when you're talking when you turn the pages. Um, would you mind just moving the pages away from the laptop or your mic? Yes, I'll do that. Thank you. Thank you. So a bedding bronze like this can be unpacked in many dimensions as a portrait, as a part of an ancestral altar, as a ritual object, glorification of ancestors, not to mention the new layers of history and memorialization and hauntedness and displacement in their connections to Western museums. Some objects, some sacred objects need to be remain sacred. Everyday objects can be haunted because of their association with a deceased individual. Consider the hat that Abraham Lincoln wore to Ford's Theater, now at the Smithsonian. Lincoln's hat is a fairly simple object. Clothing represents the person. It's a synecdoche, a part representing the whole. This hat at his side of the, at, at the moment of his assassination, reminds us of, its, of his death. So it's also a metonym. When it first came to the Smithsonian in 1867, uh, Joseph Henry, the secretary of the Smithsonian, ordered his staff not to exhibit the hat under any circumstances and to mention the matter to no one. Now, of course, it's on display as one of the museum's icons, representing both Lincoln and his death 
but it doesn't feel alive. It's a reminder, a symbol, nothing more. Ed Roberts' wheelchair is a more visceral artifact. The object represents the person, like the hat, but much more, it is something of his life. It was a part of him in some significant way. This object has particular resonance for me. Uh, I set up this photograph in uh, Its weight and its smell, its presence comes back to me whenever I look at this picture. These objects capture lives. Other objects capture death, and that's what I want to focus on for the rest of this talk. Consider these ballast weights at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. How to display the enslaved body is a challenge for museums, and there is a long history of controversy. Some museums use abstraction to avoid re-traumatizing. Some use hyper-realism to either to show horror or to connect with people. The National Museum of African American History and Culture came up with what I think is a brilliant solution, representing the enslaved people by the ballast used aboard a slave ship. A combination of authentic artifact, symbolic substitution, and material metonym. Everyday objects can become something more than that when they capture a story, when they stand in for the people who died, especially for those whose death is part of a larger tragedy. Objects can become haunted or sacred or partake of the lost humanity they represent. Objects represented with uh, objects buried with the dead can represent them, stand in for them. These are the funerary objects that NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, identified as worthy of repatriation. Or they might be objects that come to be associated with tragedy. Jewish objects that survived the Holocaust, though their owners perished. These objects somehow absorb the person or the culture that they were connected with. Museums deal with these objects in many different ways. The creators of the US Holocaust Memorial Museum had long debates about the question of how to represent victims of Nazi death camps. They were originally going to display the hair of the victims as the Auschwitz Museum does. The hair would be a synec synecdoche, uh, part of representing the whole. That was too close to displaying a body. Instead, the Holocaust Museum's Museum used objects as metonyms to represent Jewish victims. The museum replaced the proposed exhibition of the hair of Holocaust victims with a display of their shoes. The shoes are dramatically lighted and framed by a poem. We are the shoes, we are the last witnesses. The shoes and other less dramatic displays of cutlery, combs, hairbrushes, and toothbrushes are intended both as synecdoche and as metonym for those murdered. Shoes representing people, the objects representing the whole life. The museum wanted them to be what scholar Michael Bernard Donalds calls vehicles of authenticity. He argues though, based on reading thousands of visitor comments, that this exhibit failed, that they stood in the way of those visitors seeing the victims. He suggests that the objects substitute imperfectly for people and that the exhibit undermines historical authenticity that the designers wished to inculcate. Others have argued that these are moving displays and I'm in this category. Uh, Jeffrey Oshner writes that they are experienced and not just seen. When visitors see these objects, he writes, they recognize unconsciously that these objects were used by other people on their own bodies, and that these people were in fact physical living beings with a physical experience not unlike our own. The shoes allow us to connect with people. The new museum at the Sobina, Sobin, excuse me, Sobibor death camp in Poland memorializes victims through some 700 unearthed belongings arranged on a long table grouped to recall aspects of the victim's lives. Objects associated with home, 
with travel, with trades. The spokesperson for the museum writes that these objects create a parallel narrative that allows the visitor to confront the dualism of the Holocaust, its unimaginable mass scale and the individual experience of death. These objects at once represent both life and death, individual people and a culture. They tell the stories of individual lives, but traveled with the owners to the death camps and were buried there. They're both everyday objects and memorial objects and the exhibit uses them to capture that intersection. A different type of object plays a similar role in a Boston memorial to the Srebrenica genocide. Over the course of the day, many small porcelain cups, one to represent each of the murdered Bosniaks, is filled with coffee, memorializing daily life and ritual through thing and performance. The shoes, the ballast weights, the objects from Sobibar, the coffee cups, these are all artifactual representations for lost humanity, designed by museums to represent that which cannot be shown. Objects can also become haunted through their connections with those who died. Objects that survive can remind us of those that, who did not. They can acquire some of the sacredness of humanity they've come to represent. Jewish ceremonial objects are not considered sacred, but in the aftermath of the Holocaust, some have taken on a kind of sacredness. The Jewish Museum Vienna, the show depot, the open depot or uh, viewable storage area, evoked for historian Margaret Olin a sense of disquiet, sadness, and melancholy. She writes, a chill ran down my spine. Entering the room, I felt like entering, I like, felt like coming upon a body. The room seemed a tomb. The objects had the aura of mysterious relics from a vanished culture. They are come condemned to haunt the present only as a ghost. Haunted objects can be used effectively in museums. Edward Rothstein, the New York Times exhibition reviewer, also saw the mystery in the Jewish museum's display, but found it one of the most moving exhibits of religious objects I've ever seen. For Rothstein, the, the relics were monuments to a world of belief and practice. They were survivor objects, standing in for the traditions of the people who did not survive. Consider some of the objects from the 9-11 tragedy. Many died, but almost no bodies were found. The humanity that was lost somehow became part of the artifacts that survived. Perhaps the reason that museums were so focused on collecting that material. They capture varieties of hauntedness. The calorie pear, the survivor tree, survived the attack on the World Trade Center and has become, in some ways, uh, the representative of the survivors. The language that the 9-11 Museum uses to describe it makes clear its symbolic humanity. It underwent recovery and rehabilitation and stands as a living reminder of resilience, survival, and rebirth. Consider the dust, ubiquitous after the towers fell. What was it? It was, Marita Sturkin writes, a symbolic substitute for the ashes of the dead. In fact, urns with the dust were given to the families of the victims. But at the same time, the dust was considered and was toxic, too close to human remains. Uh, too, uh, dust, Sturkin argues, was a liminal substance, both numinous and mundane, a reminder that nothing ever disappears, and a reminder of what had disappeared. Material objects that have survived a cataclysmic event put on display the very transformation that turned them from ordinary objects into, of everyday life into survivor objects. They can quite literally become stand-ins for the dead. An object that is mangled, partially destroyed, and crushed symbolizes the absent bodies that were subject to the same destructive forces. Steel from the 9-11, from steel from the World Trade Center is displayed in many sites around the country. 
In fact, it's the signature object of the 9-11 Museum. These artifact memorials represent those who are lost, sometimes in an anthropomorphic way. An anthropologist who studied these memorials notes that the steel workers who collected the pieces for distribution treated it like a living being. They described the places they stored it as like a cemetery. Pieces cut off from steel used in the making of the memorials were buried. The processions that led memorials that led steel to memorials were described as resembling funeral ceremonies. The American flag draped with steel when it was removed from the site. Um, traditionally, only a coffin is draped this way. And for many, the steel is haunted in a more visceral way. The curator at, who collected specimens of the steel for the National Museum of American History and brought it into the museum was accused of polluting the building. He was told that the steel smelled of death. This presentation is mostly examples, but I hope it raises some larger questions. How does museumification and sacralization overlap? Can some objects be completely museumified? Should some objects never be used completely museumified? More generally, can we use this moment of discussion of human remains to argue that other museum objects, maybe all museum objects, should become more sacred? Or to put it in a more nuanced way, can we learn from blurring, what can we learn from blurring the edges of the sac secular sacred of the museum and the more traditional sacred of the religious? Uh, the lines of objects and living things, of static and dynamic, of secular and ritualistic, of mute and speaking, of material and spiritual. What if we treated every object in the museum as more than just an object? If we acknowledge that they're not solely material things, but bundles of human relationships as well, connecting people across time and space. Might that provide new dimensions for collecting and understanding and displaying objects, for connecting with a wider range of stakeholders? What might we gain from acknowledging that all museum objects are numinous in a range of ways? Thank you. And I'll stop staring, sharing my screen now. Thank you so much. Um, this was a fantastic presentation of, from all three of you, prompting so many questions. Um, we're going to now open to a conversation amongst the three of you. At that time also, please feel free, those of you um, who are attending, to put questions in the question and answer um, portion of your lower screen, and we will get to that at the conclusion of our um, conversation amid the panelists. So thank you. So um, I'm going to turn it over now to the three of you for your reactions, questions, comments um, among each other with our profound thanks again. I'm still processing it all, I have to say. <laughs> it's a lot to process. I, I, I just would love to know a little bit more from Susanna's talk about that the last part of the talk about the ways in which these in which the ashes were, were used and, and were traveled and were sent around the world to Holocaust museums. When that was going on, was how was that considered? Was it a was it considered a way of sharing them as being sacred or as a reminder, what, what was, what kind of language was used for those? Um, um, it was both, but very often it was uh, initiated by, uh, not by the museums, but, uh, but the survivors associations. And it was also political survivors, meaning political prisoners who, uh, who started that. And uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau, when it became engaged in, uh, in, in this, uh, exchange of gifts, because it was often uh, an exchange of, uh, of gifts, uh, of course, that did not consider at the time the, uh, the fact that uh, it might be um, 
problematic from the perspective of a Jewish uh, religious law, of course, uh, to uh, to send such gifts uh, to museums. Um, not all of them were uh, were Jewish museums, and not all of the uh, associations were of uh, of Jewish survivors. There were, for instance, uh, Dutch political prisoners who received such gifts, but also ho Holocaust uh, museums and other museums in Japan. Um, this is very under-researched uh, um, dimension of the transfer of, uh, of the ashes uh, uh, from extermination camp. And uh, unfortunately, the pandemic uh, made it impossible uh, to, to do archival research and also to visit uh, museums. But uh, I really uh, in, were greatly indebted to uh, Rand Zwickenberg for, uh, for pointing my attention to this when in his uh, book on Hiroshima, he actually looks at the exchange of, uh, of uh, gifts between, uh, between um, Auschwitz-Birkenau and Hiroshima. And of course, there is a, a lot of, of sacrality involved uh, if we decide to use this kind of uh, discourse. But it was it is also a fascinating example of how memory cultures uh, become global even before we started thinking about the globalization of memory culture. So we could think about the transfer of ashes and their travels uh, in the early post-war period uh, where it was mostly a diasporic initiative, very often coming from individuals where uh, when ashes were transferred to all uh, parts of the world by, by survivors and, and very often kept in their private homes for a long time. But this is the first dimension in which, uh, in which we can uh, talk about the globalization of this, uh, of this memory. And, and the second one is established on the more institutional level when, when there is indeed an uh, like relationships, uh, relationships of legitimization of, of the memorial sites, for instance, uh, brought also based on, on the presence of human remains. And of course, as it is the case with USHMM, uh, where the ashes or human remains were uh, intentionally not displayed uh, at the permanent or uh, exhibition, they still are incorporated into the design of the uh, of the museum, and this is the case for many Holocaust memorials. So this is, of course, the, the question of uh, of the role they came, uh, come to play when they are indeed incorporated in those museums. And of course, sacralization is very often the discourse used to uh, to to describe this uh, this operation. Um, but I was um, reminded now when, when doing uh, basic some research and uh, additional readings for this paper that it was not the discourse of sacralization and sacrality of, uh, of the sacral dimension of human remains that actually uh, resulted in human remains her, for instance, from Auschwitz not being uh, exhibited in, uh, in the museum, but their objectuality. So this is this uh, another way of thinking about the the, the human remains being totally out of place in the in the context of, of the museum so thank you so how could we do a better job of contextualizing a lot of the things that we talked about today you know in, in a museum label i'm really um confounded by how that can be done when you know, there have been studies that very few people read labels, as Bridget alluded to, you know, and that when we do write labels, um, you know, we're often, um, we, we need to keep it to a minimum, you know, of, of perhaps sometimes only a hundred words. I mean, how do, how do we convey these really intense, important, uh, new, you know, not nuances, but just, just uh, information to someone that, you know, might not, um, may not have read up on all of this material, may not be that knowledgeable, you know, and you want to convey some of the context in a, in a text panel. How do you do that? Yeah, it's, a, it's a challenge. Yeah, but first of all, this is work that the museums st still, many of them have to have to do, to do this kind of provenance research that is being done in anthropological collections or medical collections, also in memorial museums. And, uh, and this is not, not always, not necessarily the case. Yeah, I, I was struck. I was struck, Ingrid, when you said that ICOM's policy on this is basically more context. Uh, that was the answer to all these problems was just more context, which I guess is always the museum curator's um, answer to, to difficult problems. Is but we just need to explain it more. Um, I'm not sure that that works. 
really, and if you think of context as just more labels, context is in more community engagement, more, more stepping back away from thinking about things as just being, you know, in a case on by itself, um, context in, in along in modes other than words and label writing might be one way to think about how that context could could work for some of these things. Yeah, and it, I know at the RISD Museum, as well as many other museums right now, um, people, uh, museum folks, museum trained museum professionals, if you want to call them that, um, are striving to talk not just to themselves anymore, right? Not just within, you know, preaching to the converted, but to speak with communities, you know, communities that um, might have more information than, than we do regarding uh, how to contextualize, um, you know, just speaking to the descendants of, of the communities that we're trying to, that we're, we're grappling with the material culture of. Um, what do you think? Yeah, That's simply the first step for a lot of this kind of, of and for, for the kinds of objects that we're talking about, it seems essential. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with, uh, with Ingrid that uh, the communities uh, should be involved in the project. Maybe this could also translate into less ob objects at the, uh, at the exhibition. And um, also the question of ownership is, uh, of course, crucial here. You mentioned uh, uh, um, um, address the exhibition in Sobibor and indeed it is based on an extensive archaeological research and thus an extensive collection of, uh, of objects. The question is to whom do they indeed uh, and should uh, belong? Some of the objects were, uh, as we know, um, like a name tag of a specific individual uh, now living in the Netherlands was claimed by the by the relatives of uh, of this person, and because of the law in uh, in Poland, uh, instead of being handed over to the to this uh, to this family uh, and relatives of of the person, uh, it is kept at a museum exhibition. So there is also a lot of contestation, not only around human remains, but the question of appropriation and ownership uh, also when, when we are speaking about the objects. And uh, I was very inspired by your talk and would like to throw back at us, the three of us, a question about objects that uh, don't fit nicely into into uh, into categories. Mm, there is a lot of talk, uh, of course, now uh, about human and non-human actors and and those uh, objects that um, that are could be located somewhere at the threshold because between human and uh, non-human. Um, and uh, I'm not I'm thinking about hair now, for instance, but uh, human teeth, uh, which uh, are. are even dental bridges, and, and I was very much inspired by Ingrid when um, when she assertively stated that uh, that teeth are part of human remains. Um, human remains, but there are prosthetic limbs, for instance, could also be considered part of human remains. So there is a lot of like work on uh, on, on ontology of of those objects, uh, uh, prosthetic objects that that I think is still to be done uh, uh, when we think about museums. The, the question of, of hair at the Holocaust Museum. The, the descriptions of that debate are in Jewish law, hair is not considered human remains, uh, but they decided not to, to, I guess, to go by the letter of the law, but by, by the spirit of it and to say it shouldn't be displayed. Um, but yes, all those, all those edges where um, you know, clothing isn't human remains, but it has some of that feel uh, it can be so close to a person. It's a good question for research. And it would vary. I mean, I would um, just like to say it would vary, like you, you mentioned Jewish law. So it would depend on the community, right? That, that I think in museum, I mean, having worked in museums a long time, I feel safe in saying that sometimes we have sort of blanket policies, you know, that just, that just pertain ubiquitously, sort of all you know, all over the place, and that maybe we need to contour some of these policy, you know, specifically tailor them to yes. communities, and and realize that you know every community is different, and also that um, 
that opinion might change. I was trying to get to that, I guess, when I was talking that we can take the pulse of a community right now, um, but it may change in 10 years or then, you know, or sooner than that, I suppose. I mean, it seems like in the museum world, it's very, very exciting to be part of the, of the museum right now because things really are changing, you know, and, uh, and, and um, slow, but steady. <laughs> and, um, and so we just, um, this is an opportunity for us, I think, to, to reach out to communities to have more interaction and just to have more open, policies, if you want to say it, that could be revisited more frequently. So they're not so cast in stone, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Some, some of those ICOM rules you put up for, for from a long time ago. I, I have a question for you about uh, one of the pictures that you showed of the, the Red Terror Martyrs Museum, the photograph of an individual with objects from that person with the, with the bones next to it which I find very moving and disturbing at the same time. And I'm curious if what's going on there, it's, it's not the same as the sort of anonymous remains that we see everywhere else. Is that making them personal and real and, and individual? Is that somehow, is that, that's the point I imagine, but does that make it seem appropriate or more appropriate in some ways? Right. I mean, I, I have not visited that museum. I would have to defer to Bridget, um, who wrote uh, a wonderful book that was just published on the museum. Um, but it would seem that it is a different kind of exhibit. It is more personalized. I guess the question I would have is, did the family of that deceased individual, you know, consent or approve of this particular, you know, what was their involvement in, in the display? Because it looks like all of the individuals in those glass boxes were kind of treated the same. And I'm just wondering how um, custom designed those displays were to the desires or of the, of the existing fa you know, family members. But yes, I would, I, I would argue that having a, you know, a photograph of, of the actual person made it, it much more powerful, um, you know, to re related to that person, even though it's black and white photo, I, I believe. A photograph, and in one case, a watch, which just struck me as, you know, this is a precious object that is tied to the person and uh, somehow that's what comes to represent him. But, that's a complicated museum. Yeah, and I think, I wonder, you know, if it's going to, they don't, um, ICOM Code of Ethics doesn't seem to address memorial or genocidal museums. And I think may, maybe it's a different category. You know, I, I would think, and um, we need to refine uh, maybe what um, we're thinking and and get more input from, there's so many memorial museums. When I was researching, there's just so many and they're all handled very differently and there isn't just one way. And, and so um, I think uh, some kind of subcommittee with a lot of input from various cultures needs to be formed. It's probably not, not optimal to have just one set of guidelines, of course. Right. Uh, and cultural sensitivities, religious sensitivities needs to be also taken confer into consideration. There are cultures and contexts uh, when where human remains are not at all sacred. It's uh, it does not uh, like they, they don't have they, they are not charged in in the same way as and as in other contexts. And it's also I think very important to take into consideration the political dimension of, of claims, for instance, for repatriations, a repatriation where they are directed at the uh, former colonizers. It's a very different dynamic from the dynamic that, for instance, uh, governs the treatment of human remains in uh, in Ethiopia that I don't know that much about, or uh, or Rwanda, where where there is an also like since the 1994, there is a constant dynamic process of renegotiation uh, whether they should be uh, exhibited, how should they be exhibited, who decides and why. Uh, 
uh, and also uh, in the context, in the Cambodian context, there is uh, again uh, because this is the, the the religious framework in which or cultural framework in which crema cremation was a standard uh, way of handling human remains. The question is. Uh, and th there are calls for, for reconsideration of, of the exhibition of human remains based on this. So I think that it's very important to, uh, to localize and historicize those, mm -hmm. uh, those processes, because it could be also easy to, to, um, uh, to be uh, very concerned about the presence of uh, human ashes in the Holocaust museums, but the very trajectory through which they arrived there the affective, emotional, and, and, uh, and memorial context from, from which the, they originate makes it difficult to be simply dismissive about it. And yeah, mm -hmm. this is what I think. I'm wondering as we turn now to the questions and answers that we could perhaps just um, turn to Bridget for one moment um, to speak a little bit to the issue that Ingrid um, rose about the museum that she has written about. And then we will go to the um, to our questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, but just wonderful presentations, very provocative. Um, so at the Red Terror Museum, it was created by um, an association of families and friends of the victims of the Red Terror. Um, but even within that association, there were a lot of different views. And then um, there are different views. If you look at visitor comments, that's what I did as part of my research, um, some of whom um, were in favor of having, and sometimes their own loved ones' bones um, displayed. And other visitors thought it was completely inappropriate and disarming and um, um, sort of alienating. Um, and one of the challenges I think for memorial museums is who are they for? Um, it's just a constant challenge. Are they for victims? Are they for the survivors? Are they for the audiences that come through, the multiple audiences and how did they change over time? Um, why would you create a museum if it was primarily for the victims, right? Especially with public funds um, or why would the public even come? Um, and then the place of bones is, is really scandalous in many ways, objects in the midst of that. Um, so that's one thing in, in the Red Terror Museum, it's, it's, it's complicated by that. And there are some bones that are displayed that have the names in a photo. And then there's another set that are displayed by body part. Um, so femurs, skulls, um, and... Um, and, and so on. Um, and there's definitely no easy answer. Just one other thing is there are also on the side of family members, sometimes, and some survivor groups, there's also a, a concerted effort to make the violence horrible. Um, you know, since that what it was um, in genocide and mass atrocities was terrifying, overwhelming, ugly, and dehumanizing. And the more we try to clean it up and make it palatable for visitors, the more we do a secondary violence to what it was. Now, not everybody agrees with that. Others would say, no, let's keep with religious um, traditions, right? And how we treat um, the dead and those objects that come from the dead. Um, but there is by no means an easy answer. Thank you so much, Bridget. Um, I want to turn to our questions and answers because uh, questions because we have uh, those addressed to each of the individual panelists. We have one each at least. So I'd like to uh, ask those questions of our specific panelists. And then um, there's a couple that are more uh, general. The first one um, is from Pinar and it is for Ingrid. Um, do you have any information on what the Egyptian Museum did after 19, their 1970 statement about the displaying of mummies more respectfully? How different did they display mummified remains after that? Yes, um, that's an excellent question. And I'm afraid I wasn't able to find any information specifically about that, nor have I actually been to that museum, you know, um, to, to to investigate it myself. Um, all I can say is that, um, you know, recently in preparing for this talk, 
on several occasions, there were new discoveries made in Egypt that I became aware of recently, you know, where they were discovering uh, sarcophagi, they were opening them publicly, it was on the BBC and so forth. So, I mean, this is still, um, which I thought was rather, you know, it was difficult for me to see that. So I don't really know. Um, I discuss this a lot with the curator of uh, ancient art at the RISD Museum. We discuss um, issues of displaying um, as mean and so forth. Um, and it's very apparently in in Egypt because of um, the long the long history there of, of archaeology and and um, I understand that. The, there's a sort of an understood context, but I don't, I, to answer his question, unfortunately, I don't really have a specific answer for that. I don't know what they did, unless that someone else does. Oh, well. Sorry. Thank you. To be continued. It's a, it yeah, is a to, very, a I'll have to keep question. probing. Yeah. And we have a comment for Susanna um, from Ridwan. Your discussion and thinking about ashes and material remains made me wonder about the extent to which the materiality of the human, the person, in context of genocide, mass violence, and political violence underscores not so much the materiality of the dead body or its fragment as ashes, as it points to something like the immaterial materiality of human remains, ashes, and perhaps more akin to what Derrida refers to as cinders, in which ashes, quote, erases itself totally, radically, while presenting itself. In this sense, ashes can be regarded as more than the trace of the human or the context in which the human is reduced to ashes. I'm just wondering, Susanna, if you have a comment on that. Yeah, I spent a lot of time with, with Derrida also uh, in my uh, previous thinking of ashes when, uh, when I was uh, working through ashes thinking in, in terms of subjectification and uh, objectification and of course I uh, I totally agree that this literalization that I mentioned in uh, in the context of uh, forensic practices that uh, take place at the former extermination camps which they do uh, or the artistic intervention that was uh, performed by uh, by the center for the, from, for the political beauty which also drew from those from this forensic imagery uh, actually are uh, as any other practice uh, pertaining to human remains reductive. So following the Rida, I would also definitely see uh, ashes, cinders as a, uh, maybe not, not a metaphor, but a, the deconstructive figure of the, uh, of the reality, the post-genocide reality, but also as inherently excessive. And in this way, uh, speaking to, to what Stephen was talking about, uh, haunted and haunting. Uh, I didn't get to talk about survivance as a category, indeed, which I promised in the title of the, of the presentation, uh, but I didn't, but uh, exactly working with, uh, with Derrida and, and his conceptualization of, of ashes, I, I think uh, about their being, their, their materiality, but also their uh, affective uh, political uh, like the afterlives in, in terms of survivance, which, which speaks to Derrida's uh, non being there, but still uh, being there in a way that destabilizes uh, the, the reality that, uh, that comes after. So thank you very much for, the, for this comment. Um, I should have brought it more to, to the fore, but, but yes, indeed the context, the, the, my, my, my question was how this literalization, exactly reduction of ash to human uh, remains, conceptually also what consequences does it have for their presence in, in museums and around museums and, and in spaces that belong to museums. Well, thank you so much. And now um, to Steve, a question uh, from Beverly. Can you say something more about the sense of the sacred that can be invoked in the unusually very secular context of our classrooms and museums? Hi, Beverly. Um, it's a good question. And it seems to me that there's some overlap between the museums are secular spaces, but they're also sacred secular spaces. And I wonder if we couldn't play with that. Um, and 
you know, museums have tried so hard to move away from being a temple, but in fact, that is a part of what they are. Uh, and whether playing with that notion of expanding what it means to be a temple beyond a place to worship, but also a place to, to participate um, with others might be a way to, to think about that. I've been fascinated in preparing for this talk. Part of what I prepared but did not have had to cut out was museums that have begun to display sacred objects as sacred objects. Um, so the Buddha at the uh, museum in Lanka, uh, Manchester in, in the UK, or the Tibetan altar at the Newark Museum, which has been blessed by the Dalai Lama as a Tibetan altar, or displays of um, uh, Haitian voodoo that are considered to be voodoo altars, even though they're made out of museum things. There might be interesting ways to, to, to think about museums as literally religious sacred spaces as well. The part of your question on the um, on the classrooms is much harder. Uh, that I'm not sure how that might work. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question, um, several, two questions, which are really open for, for all of you, I think, from Emily. Do you think these questions apply to human remains that might be observed in situ? Or is it only the act of moving the object that brings up these questions of ownership and the ethical handling of said object? And I think that's something for all of the panelists. Yeah, if I might claim the, <laughs> claim the floor now. Of I, course. Um, I have been thinking about this question a lot um, because my research uh, is or was uh, till date primarily on the former extermination camps. Uh, now uh, the territory of Poland, um, spaces that, uh, that contain human remains that are um, more or less uh, accurately framed by the uh, by the museums and uh, in this context I I was uh, trying to conceptualize forms of violence that uh, that the human remains can be subjected to and I think that there are quite a lot um, <laughs> forms of violence that ranging from invasive archaeological research to uh, to abandonment abandonment for instance when there is a politically motivated structural abandonment of human remains which allows uh, the body disposal pits to be um, uh, to be um, looted by by the local populations or, or uh, littered or uh, or simply uh, reused in a ways that are totally disrespectful for uh, for affected communities, then uh, then we can speak about uh, a wide range of uh, of, hum of violence um, that that um, human remains can be subjected to, also in in situ context. I was struck by the pictures that Ingrid showed of the bog bodies, uh, the way in which they were sort of put in, their, their context was moved to, to the museum. The same thing was true of the, the exhibition of um, Jamestown bodies at the uh, National, Natural Museum of Natural History a few years ago, where they brought in, uh, they sort of recreated the context of, of the graves as a way of, to show the, the human remains. I don't, know that it is respectful in, in the ways that we've been talking about, but it is a way of, of thinking about that in situ context that is, you know, part of, helps to tell that story perhaps. Right, it might be that it's the lesser of two evils maybe that, that uh, to contextualize it, and if you were to see the human remains, you know, in their original context, perhaps it would convey a lot more possibly than a museum label could possibly convey, you know, so I don't know, maybe it's, 
would be helpful because I, I don't think we can assume that when people visit the museum, they, they come with, you know, a lot of knowledge, right? They, they might, you know, people who come to the museum come from all different standpoints. So um, to, to make it accessible and like inclusive for all people is really challenging so without using uh, original, the original content. I think it really helps to put it in the original context. Thank you so much. Um, we have a, uh, a, a final question um, that is of a local that is of Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I'm sitting at the moment, um, but it is uh, for all three of you. Um, Daniel asks, do any of you have any specific observations about the situation at the Peabody Museum at Harvard, which finds itself with the remains of 15 formerly enslaved people? And I don't know if this is specifically that you have a specific knowledge or that you would just offer some observations um, on this, this situation. So perhaps each of you could just uh, briefly address that as we finish up. I, I, so I, don't, I don't have any inside information or specific information about that. What I thought was fascinating was that the, at the same time they made the announcement that they had found the remains of 15 formerly enslaved people, as they mentioned. And by the way, this is part of a collection of thousands of human remains at the museum um, that are, I assume, mostly Native American. Although um, when we were thinking about, uh, when Susanna was talking about the ways in which ashes were shipped around the world, uh, human remains, skeletons were shipped around the world between museums as well. Uh, and so there was a whole trade of, of, of skeletons among museums. It's part of a larger context. I guess I wasn't surprised when, when I saw that announcement. What interests me is to see what they will do with it. Um, the major question for NAGPRA, for the Native American Graves and uh, Protection and Repatriation Act is, what to do what are, with what are called unaffiliated remains, uh, remains that you can't directly attach to an existing current Indian nation. And I don't know how much information they have about these remains, uh, but who is it that will be, take responsibility for it? The example that came to mind also is the, um, the African burial ground in New York City. Uh, which was a very large, uh, thousands and thousands of, of enslaved Africans were buried in the 17th and 18th century. Uh, when, it was, when it was uncovered as part of building a new building, extensive archeological work that was done there and uh, a very interesting, complicated uh, reburial process that was very much an African reburial process whether that might be appropriate or a model to look at, be something to think about. Ingrid, would you have comments, even if you don't know this particular instance, because you have had so much yeah. experience with this? I, I don't know. I mean, I guess this is maybe an opportunity. Um, forensic scientists, um, you know, I, I talked a lot about medical museums and, you know, the inappropriate maybe, you know, rationale for collecting um, people in the past there, but um, maybe forensic science could help. You know, science can play a role. It can be, play an important role in identifying people and, and um, perhaps, you know, which African country they came from, you know, this kind of thing. Um, you know, how, how um, yeah, to, to try to find um, direct ancestry, um, or descendants rather of um, these enslaved people, I think it could possibly be done, you know, through forensic science, but I don't know enough about that, but that would be a really, that may be the wave of the future, you know, trying to, um, we, you know, every year the science improves and there's just tremendous abilities for DNA research, you know, even in, even in art conservation and museums, um, we were, you know, starting to do more DNA research, um, and so I would hope that maybe um, with 
that Harvard might be able to be leaders, maybe the Peabody could be leaders in this field and do DNA research and possibly find descendants of these, these individuals. Um, I don't think it's um, outside of the realm of possibility. It's very exciting to think about the role of science in a good way that it could promote, you know, return, the return and the proper burial of these individuals. And Susanna, would there be perhaps lessons to be learned from your experiences in Europe um, that might inform a conversation about this particular I, I'm also not that familiar with the case, but uh, I was triggered immediately by uh, by reference to forensic science, especially forensic genetics, uh, genetics, because I um, uh, I have some problems with it and how it is being uh, applied in order to essentialize uh, identities always uh, also, and how actually this essentialization that results from from uh, DNA establishment of uh, belonging to a particular uh, cultural uh, group, which is of course impossible, uh, translates them uh, then into abandonment of uh, of those remains. And um, and of course, uh, it is very important that the remains are returned, repatriated, returned to the group of interest. But if there is no group of interests, uh, um, sometimes uh, the, the so looking for it actually takes the hands over the responsibility for, for those remains, but also for the crimes that are behind the presence of those remains uh, from, from the hands of, the, uh, of those who are responsible. So sometimes having to deal with, with unclaimed remains, especially if, uh, if these are enslaved, human remains of enslaved people, it maybe would be interesting to see how to uh, own them and uh, what could come out of, 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 of uh, owning them. Oh, thank you so much. And I want to just turn for a moment to Bridget um, as a kind of bridge to our next panel. Yeah, the, the question reminded me of um, a story from Guatemala where remains were not identified and the community welcomed them back and said if they belong to no one, then they belong to us um, and, and owned them. And that sense is on a, of, of they are ours, they're our people. Um, and our next um, presentation, our next panel is on March 16th. Um, it starts at 11 in the morning and it will directly connect to this question as well. Um, we have Julia Vivac whose work focuses on survivor communities that care for the dead. Um, and care for all the dead, um, or all the ones at particular sites, and that relationship between surviving and caring for the dead. Um, and Isaias Rojas Perez, who will speak um, about similar relationships of care in Peru. Um, so I'll hand it back to Diane to conclude. Thank you so much. Um... Each one of these panels has been um, ever richer and deeper building on the ones before it. Um, those of you that have been able to attend them, you see the, the development of this, which is really quite extraordinary. Um, I'm, we will put in the um, chat box the link for you to register for the upcoming two panels. And everyone that has registered today uh, will be receiving an email for morning remains uh, on Tuesday, March 16th, um, as Bridget said, at 11 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. We hope that you will be able to join us and then for our fifth and final uh, panel in April. Uh, we will say just as um, we're ending now, it's exactly at, at 12 Eastern time, to say that when, we, when Bridget and I put together this notion of in their presence, um, we had our own experiences, mine of, of working, um, attempting to restitute and reburial, rebury remains from a desecrated Jewish cemetery in Vienna. Bridget, as you know, working in the Martyrs Museum in, in Addis Ababa, uh, that we had very specific contexts. We could not even have imagined the richness and fullness complexity um, of the issues that were brought to bear from our very specific examples outward.
and um, to just thank the three of you for remarkable, thoughtful presentations, um, challenging materiality and immateriality and subject and object, and also the relationship of ethics, not just to practice or even to material, but also to the ineffable. So thank you so much. And we look forward to having you join us, um, our panelists, as well as all of you um, from many continents, uh, which came today to, to hear this panel. Thank you so much.